Welcome back to another video on ESP IDF. Today's topic is the I2C protocol. We'll cover the basics of I2C and its API in ESP IDF, then apply them to build an I2C scanner, and then read temperature data from the barometric pressure sensor, BMP180. I2C is one of the most common serial communication protocols, with the others being SPI and UART, which you may be familiar with if you are learning embedded systems. It has two lines, SCL for clock and SDA for data. Since it is serial, the data is transferred bit by bit along the SDA line. The SCL line is the clock that helps synchronize the output of bits transferred on the SDA line with the clock signal shared between the master and the slave. The master always controls the clock signal and only the master can initiate the transfer although both can transmit data over the I2C bus. Both the SDA and the SCL lines are open drain drivers, so the chips can only output high and not low. So for the line to go high, you need pull-up resistors. However, in the later examples, we will only use code to enable the internal pull-up resistors of the ESP32, so there's no need to prepare external pull-up resistors when you're following this video. In I2C, data is transferred as messages, which are broken into many frames of data. Each message contains an address frame and one or more data frames that transmit the actual data. There are also start and stop conditions, read write bit and ACK, acknowledge, or NAC, not acknowledge bit. Let me elaborate on these new terms. Start condition, the SDA line switches from a high voltage level to a low voltage level before the SCL line switches from high to low. Stop condition, the SDA line switches from a low voltage level to a high voltage level after the SCL line switches from low to high. Address frame, a seven or 10 bit sequence unique to each slave that identifies the slave when the master wants to talk to it. Read write bit, a single bit specifying whether the master is sending data to the slave, low voltage level, or requesting data from it, high voltage level. It is low when the master wants to send data and vice versa. ACK slash NAC bit. Each frame in a message is followed by an acknowledge slash no acknowledge bit. If an address frame or data frame was successfully received, an ACK bit is returned to the sender from the receiving device. So the steps of I2C communication are as follows. One, the master sends the start condition to. The master sends each slave device the address it wants to send to, along with a read and write bit. Three, the slaves compare the address sent by the master with its address. If correct, the slave returns ACK bit by pulling SDA low for a bit. It remains high if the address doesn't match four. The master sends or receives the data frame five. After each successful transfer, the receiving device returns another ACK bit to the sender. The master ends data transmission by switching SCL high before SDA. To start using I2C, you need to include the proper headers file. This video is only about working as I2C master, so you only need to include the I2C master.h file. Note that the old i2c.h is only for legacy applications and should not be used in newer versions of ESPIDF. You also need to modify the cmakelist.txt like follows for ESPIDF version 5 onwards. To work with the i2c, you need a bus handle and device handle for the device on the bus. This demo code gives you an example of how you can configure these handles before initializing the handles themselves. Once done creating the I2C bus and device handle, you can start performing read or write operations as the I2C master with the following API. For our circuit, we will use a BMP180 barometric pressure sensor running on 3.3 volts and the SDA and SCL pins corresponding to pins 21 and 22 of the ESP32. This is a sensor with I2C interface. We use the following circuit for our two tasks shown on the screen. Build an I2C scanner 
and read temperature data from the BMP-180 sensor. The I2C bus handle init function configures the port to be zero, the SDA and the SCL pins being 21 and 22 respectively, but note that you can change this to other GPIO if you want. We use default clock source and enable internal pull-up resistor. I also created the function for the initialization of the device handle, but note that this isn't needed for the I2C scanner and will be used in the next example. The frequency is 100,000 Hertz, and it uses a 7-bit address, which will be specified later. Inside the task function, we will loop through all possible addresses and use the I2C master probe function on those addresses. It will return ESP OK if it finds I2C devices with this address. Also, note that the free RTOS task function requires the function to use a void pointer as parameter, so I need to typecast the bus handle as its intended type before running the loop. Flash the code and we find out that the I2C address is 0x77 in hex. We can verify this with the website i2cdevices.org, which lists common I2C devices and their addresses. Our next example would be writing and reading from the BMP-180 sensor. Since the method of extracting the atmospheric pressure is similar, we will only read the temperature data for demonstration. We have to define registers to be used with BMP-180. These registers can be found in the data sheet of the sensor. The bus and device handle initialization functions are kept the same. But now we will also define functions for writing and reading from the sensor. The read byte function parses a specified number of bytes to read into our buffer array. The write byte function sends the data in an array of two bytes consisting of the address register and one byte of data. Now we start reading the calibration data from the BMP-180. They have 11 parameters in total in the type of either int16 or u int16. So we have to combine each two subsequent bytes by left, shifting the first byte by 8 bits and using logical or with the second byte. The uncompensated temperature data can be extracted by first sending to the control register a request command which is defined at the beginning of the code. Then we delay by 5 microseconds and start reading from another register to get the result in the form of two bytes and merge it to an NT16. To obtain meaningful data, we have to perform calculations based on the raw data with the calibration value. The algorithm of the calculation is mentioned in the datasheet. flashing the code and test it on the serial monitor. By comparing my result with another person, 
who is working with the STM32 to perform the same task. I find the calibration value to be similar in range. The weather data is like three degrees Celsius higher than the correct temperature, but that's acceptable to me. Anyways, this concludes our video. I hope that you learned something meaningful about the I2C peripheral and working with it in ESPIDF. Also, I should add that this is the last long form video from me in 2024. Thank you guys for showing your support to my channel during the four months I have been working on it, and I will keep uploading, although the frequency might be lower due to my tight schedule. Hope you guys enjoy the Christmas holiday and New Year's Eve. See you in 2025.